Welcome to Healthy Planet, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. Joining me today are Kailali Stanich and Christian De Cavedo from Leahi Landscaping. Welcome, Malo and Christian. Thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much for being on the show. So uh, we're going to talk about sustainable landscaping today, but we want to know, how did you guys come to start Leahi Landscaping? Um, so the idea actually came, like most ideas, uh, from a place of anger, where um, I, I feel like a lot of people in our generation, you know, we have uh, a lot of anger that kind of brings us towards conclusions that create businesses. So um, for us, it was a mixed bag of getting woken up by the loud landscaping crews all the time, almost every day for the entirety of our lives. And then also just the lack of environmental concern and reason, which goes into landscaping. Um, so the company was originally started in 2020, December, I believe, uh, as an idea that a friend and I, uh, Scott Tabor, had at a dinner party. Um, Scott and I played around with the idea, tried to get things kind of up and running. Um, Scott works for a bank, so we ended up having to step back. And it was about that same time that I met Kaimalu. Uh, and Malu and I met at a dinner party of a friend of ours. Um, and, you know, it, we just clicked immediately. Um, I think the, the intro was Malu and I were talking, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a, I'm a landscape designer. Oh, that's so cool. I just started a landscaping company. Uh, it's an electric, uh, all electric landscaping company. And Molly just looks at his girlfriend and just goes, because um, <laughs> we had both had the same idea and we were both moving in the same direction. And it was beautiful coincidence that brought us together. That's great. So, so tell us about what your background is, Malu, and, um, and then maybe Christian can tell us. Sure. Um, so I grew up on Maui, um, graduated from Kamehameha schools and started uh, my studies in architecture. So um, that's kind of where I imagined going. I know there was a lot of kind of environmental concerns around buildings specific specifically. Um, but as I went through my studies, I realized I wasn't so much designing architecture as I was designing landscape architecture. Um, so that's kind of what I ended up finishing my degree in, um, in, uh, 2021. So I have a master's in landscape architecture and just a passion for the environment in general. So that's, that's kind of my background. I currently work for, um, the university of Hawaii community design center. So that's also an added layer of, um, of consideration for the community and, um, appropriateness for the culture. What is the community design center at UHM? Yeah, so we run out of the School of Architecture. Uh, we work on uh, public-focused or nonprofit design projects, oftentimes um, pre-procurement, so uh, before the professional team works on it. So it's a lot of conceptual design, um, incorporating uh, community concerns into actual built structures. And how about you, Christian? What's your background? Um, so I actually come more from a place of business than anything. Uh, my undergrad was concentrations in finance and accounting. Um, I ended up going back to school later on and finishing with an MBA and a Juris Doctorate um, from the University of Hawaii. And uh, um, yeah, I, I've mostly been in the business world. I worked for Tesla for a couple of years. So my background is in electrification. Um, and then also just a slight politics touch to just got involved with the, uh, the neighborhood board in Kahala. Actually, Grace, I believe you might fall into our uh, our jurisdiction, um, but uh, became vice chair and, you know, just uh, just getting involved in the community here. So that's great. So tell us about, you know, the way your company is all electric. How do you do it? Do you do it off solar power? Molly, you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. Um, so we are all electric that kind of falls directly within our main mission and ethos of being just more environmentally friendly. Um, we do uh, charge everything off of a standalone solar facility. So 
we are entirely zero emission um, in regards to our tools. And also, I was wondering, it looks like that you guys began the company and specifically Mauna Lua Bay. Was there a reason for that? Sure. Um, yeah, again, I think Christian spoke to it a little bit. The frustration of um, kind of watching our environment around us um, being neglected and degradating. Um, we started uh, mostly uh, where we live. So Kahala, Manoa those kinds of areas, those are areas surrounding Mauna Lua Bay. And actually in, in 2002, uh, Mauna Lua Bay was uh, deemed a contaminated water body. And that was um, not because there's a heavy amount of industry or commercial spills or anything like that. It's a direct result of residential landscapes and the unsustainable practices that homeowners and landscape companies and they employ on top of their their yards. So mm -hmm. um, part of this this business was to kind of push back against that and um, provide another option, an alternative way to treat your environment, treat your yard. So Christian, yeah. can you tell us specifically what is not sustainable about how people are treating their yard? What are what are people doing that is not sustainable? So people know not to do that. I I mean it's um like many other products and industries in our day to day life the there's the monetary cost and then there is what's called the total cost the true cost um, and what we've found just through our personal research and sort of exploration is that the landscaping industry is actually one of the most impactful and harmful industries. In the world, in addition to that, it's something that is directly in our environment every day. We've sort of been sold this idea of the perfect manicured lawn, the perfect, you know, green space in your in your home. And don't worry, there are these these sprays that take care of everything for you, so you don't have to concern yourself with it. There are these machines that uh, you know will come in and will make it look in a way that we view in our minds as natural, but is extremely unnatural. Um, there are so many, if you look at sort of each individual part that goes into landscaping, you'll, you'll find that there is a, a kind of this horrifying theme of, we just need to get it done. We just need to get it done and by any means necessary. And so you'll find application of chemicals, of gasoline and high particulate motors in close proximity to you, know, you, your family, your pets. And these these have negative externalities that spin off onto us. Even, you know, and it takes it takes place on both sides. You have the health of the person living in the home or in the uh, the landscape, whether that's a personal residence, a hotel, a business. And then you have the crews who are actively um, involved in this process too. Um, so on the crew side, you know, they're exposed to uh, the chemicals like Roundup uh, glyphosate, um, which has been shown to cause many types of cancers. My father uh, actually has Parkinson's and part of the main belief that why he has Parkinson's is because of his exposure to glyphosate at a young age. Um, so you have these, these people who are being exposed to these things day after day after day. Um, even gasoline motors, the vibrations from them can cause this uh, nerve damage disease, which, you know, it, it doesn't roll back. It only progresses more and more. Um, and then, you know, you have you, the homeowner, who after these people come and, you know, cut your lawn and blow these uh, chemicals, and these emissions and these particulates into the air in your direct living space, your working space, uh, your vacation space you are then exposed to it every single day. Every day you step outside, every day you walk on the grass, you know, lay on your lawn, you are exposed to it. And even those who don't own homes, even those who aren't privileged enough or fortunate enough to be able to afford their own, uh, like their own land, you have these negative externalities spilling off into public spaces too. Malu mentioned Wanalua Bay. And, uh, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to live in Kahala for most of my life. And I had a saltwater fish tank 
growing up. My dad had one rule. You have to catch everything yourself. You're not allowed to buy anything. Um, so three days a week, I would go down to the beach in the late afternoon after school with my dad. And we would swim around with nets and, you know, try and catch new fish. And, you know, it was a small tank, 25 gallons, but, you know, it was mine. It was fun. It really involved me in the environment. And that repeated my, what I saw from like a young kid, even to now, you can literally witness the changes that are occurring in our environment. I used to swim out there and I would see turtles and I would see more eels and all sorts of beautiful fish and an ecosystem that you, you could tell it was being affected by something, but it was still there. Nowadays, I swim out to the exact same beach and there's nothing. It's desolate. It's dead. It's unproductive in the environmental sense. And, um, you know, a lot of that is caused by fertilizer runoff, by um, sea walls that are being installed, which causes change to the local ecosystems. Uh, nothing is without consequence and the landscaping industry as a whole has sort of either failed to understand or more likely just sort of ignored the true cost of their product and it affects all of us. Yeah, I mean, that is terrible. So um, I am wondering what can people do then? I mean, if suppose, I mean, obviously they can hire you guys, but um, what can people do if they do not want to spray their yard with pesticides, but they have all these terrible invasive plants in their yard? How do they get rid of them? What can they do? And um, and then I know um, you have a bunch of slides about let's I want to also talk about what kind of plants can we plant? Like what are good plants that we can plant there so that we don't end up having this issue where, you know, we're having to fertilize a lot and it's poisonous to the bay and everything. Um, if you could take this one. Yeah, sure. So we've been cultivating this approach that we call um, like a landscape stewardship approach to the to um, res residential houses specifically. Um, but it's basically an ecological approach to yard maintenance. Um, and it incorporates these kinds of larger systems thinking into the small scale residential home. Um, so this this is including um, a bunch of different um, sections. Obviously, we talked about the low emission equipment. This is cutting down on the uh, global effect of carbon on the environment, but also the kind of local effect of the particulates and the volatile organic compounds that you find floating within the air around your home. Um, but but alongside that, um, we also have this this approach to uh, maybe invasive species or just kind of um, unwanted species, maybe in general, and. Uh, we try and go and, and we categorize it based off of uh, the three C's. Um, so our approach is competition, um, concentration, or companionship. Um, so competition, I think, is most easily conceptualized in terms of the maybe evolutionary competition. So this happens kind of naturally. Um, if, if you have a, a mature ecosystem, that kind of overcrowds the smaller plants so you can maybe plant more plants to discourage the unwanted plants from showing up. Um, you could also give a competitive advantage so um, to the plants that you want to plant. So we oftentimes just manual weeding is, um, is you know, you can't go wrong. It's, it's hard work. And um, yeah, you, sometimes you have to know what, what you, um, how to get rid of things like haulukoa. There's, there's a lot of um, effort that goes into it, but um, you know, I think being able to select uh, the, the wanted plants from the unwanted plants, I think is also important. Um, the second C is uh, concentration. So we, all, we often use these kinds of larger scale um, concentrations of elements to maintain populations of plants. I think a good example of, of this would be if you had a house next to the ocean and you had some native plants that were maybe salt tolerant, then you could maybe pour salt water to get rid of the unwanted plants and your herbicide becomes salt, the concentration of salt. And um, that salt may dissipate into the, the natural environment quickly um, with some watering. Um, but you are able to select the plants that you want to grow. And um, you do so by understanding what plants you have and what they need and what they don't need. Um, a classic one that we use is, is vinegar. 
vinegar is uh, basically an acid. You can increase the acidity of the soil. Um, it's oftentimes a kind of scorch the earth approach. If you have maybe some pavers that you want it, do you don't want anything to grow on? We'll pour some vinegar. It'll dissipate into the environment naturally, and um, you can also add compost or organic matter to increase the base level of your soil. And um, the last C is companionship. So everybody's, I think, I hope is familiar with companion planting, um, but this is it's the concept that you know these. These uh, species have evolved or co-evolved with other species naturally. And if you plant those species together in these larger guilds, then they increase uh, the survivability, the beneficial insects, the beneficial microorganisms of your yard and decrease the need for uh, maybe herbicides or pesticides in the future. Yeah, no, that's all sounds great. Um, I saw that you have a slide with a before after a picture of the house that you guys designed the landscape for. Can you show us that house? So you want to explain what happened here, Christian? You know, I I might be okay at this, but let me tell you, Malu is the <laughs> the master. So I'm gonna I'm gonna blow a little bit of hot air here for a second. Um, <laughs> The things that Kaimalu is doing with technology and historical research is next level. I, when I say that nobody else is doing this, I, I truly mean that nobody else is doing what he is doing. It is such a, it's an honor and a pleasure to just even watch him sort of get down into the weeds of this stuff. Um, I, you know, I, that that's my two thought thoughts on it. But uh, Malu, can you talk a little bit about the, everything that goes into the design, everything that you do, and just how you breathe magic into that. Sure. So it all comes from the same place. So this kind of environmental lens, um, ecological thinking, systems thinking. So yeah, uh, we did we did a design and install for this house here. Um, this is incorporating not only native and native species, but also these kinds of more natural textures and pattern generation methods um, alongside um, some of this more maybe cutting edge um, technology that we have we have available to us, you know, in the 21st century. Century. So, on the left here, you can see a before and after of the landscape, and this kind of unique pattern there of the pathways themselves. Um, this is again mimicking patterns that you can find all throughout nature. Um, this specific one is called a Voronoi uh, partition, Voronoi pattern. But it occurs ac across all scales, from the cellular all the way up to um, you know our own pathways within uh, that we see within the wild, and then even all the way up through um, using cosmic scales. But um, it's kind of this consistency of you know natural touch all the way throughout the design, and um, that that uh, design in particular and the installation in particular was actually in California. So uh, the benefit to this approach I think that we've generated is that it it can apply across different ecosystems and across different cultures. So a lot of our research in that sense was with the particular indigenous culture there and how they used their native plants, the Chumash, and um, what they, the legends that they had surrounding them and the importance that they, they placed on top of the ecosystem. And oh, that's great. Now you had that one slide of Guadalupe and showing that you looked at the native plants and then determined from there how to do a landscape. So can you yeah. go to the slide where there's native plants, Michael, and then log? Sure. Yeah. That, that slide that you were just on kind of touches on this kind of what we're calling biocultural research, where there's this embodied knowledge within the indigenous culture that I think um, we we all benefit from. Um, and it the more that you kind of dive into this, um, the more these uh, these decisions become more, make more sense and become more natural. So this particular uh, design was in the Ili of Guadalupe. So again, we, we're thinking on all scales. So we, we go all the way from the island scale of Oahu, we're within the Moku of Kona, within the Ahupua of Waikiki and then the Ili, so the, the valley itself is Wailupe. Um, I believe most people know it as Aina Aina now. But um, those, those 
Mo'olelo, those those stories of the place, they talk about the winds, the type of winds, the type of rains. These are all um, factors that play into whether uh, what to plant, what, to, what is appropriate for that space. Um, so the next slide there was place names, actually, and, as well as um, some street names. But they begin to talk about what used to grow there, uh, the Willy Willy, the Kului, all these kinds of um, more dry land to Messick um, types of species. So these are uh, just considerations as we go through the design process, and it, it kind of gives us a list of plants that we can pull from when we start designing the landscape itself. So Christian, can you tell us about your nursery and how you obtain these plants and how you guys get these native plants that might not be in landscapes anymore? Um, so we've been very fortunate in that we have, our customer base is very supportive of what we do. Um, and none of this would be happening without them, without every single one of them. Um, and this is still sort of a, a growth area for us. We are trying to diversify as quickly as we can. Um, with the limited resources that we have as a small business in the state of Hawaii, um, we, you know, it can be a struggle. None of the progress we would have made would have occurred without the community that we have behind us. Um, so we were, most companies would be able to just come in and sort of buy the resources that they need. We take a different approach. We are in the community. We are talking to everybody in these environmentally concerned industries and individuals who they have something that we need. And chances are we have something that they need. And through labor trades, through even just simple discussions, we can obtain resources that we require to advance forward on a corporate level that allows us the diversification that will enable us to lower our pricing and make these types of services more affordable. One of the diversification measures that we've taken is our nursery. Um, the nursery is... Uh, let's see, we finished the irrigation on it about three or four weeks ago. It's part of a service contract that we have with a local farmer who has been gracious enough to help us and provide guidance. And, you know, in exchange, we help her in every single way that we can. We've helped clear cutting for her. Uh, we've helped her establish, you know, uh, different relationships with different native plants. We, it's been truly a give, give relationship where we're both just you know, Malu and I are just pouring everything we can to see her succeed. And she is really just helping us. Now, and it's not even just on the nursery side, uh, Kaimuki Compost, Nate Hodgson, who I believe was uh, on this show, you know, it, the exact same thing. Here we have a concerned individual in this environment who is trying to make a change just as a single person, a single entity LLC. And Malu and I are on a very similar scale. We're a small business just trying to make it. And what we found is that through conversation, through understanding, we have been able to provide each other products and resources that we normally wouldn't have access to through that communication and through that relationship. Um, there is no money being exchanged between us, but we have developed incredible value through each other. Um, and we just make each other stronger. We've created sort of a, a hui of small business owners who are on a very similar playing field and area that we are. And what we found is that, you know, much like a fist, the more fingers you've got curled together, it's strong. And we've taken these tiny little businesses and we have created enormous, enormous growth potential and enormous value through it. Um, so our nursery is just going to be another step that we take to provide native plants to provide uh, the affordability that's required. You know, it's easy to say, hey, be more environmentally friendly, like do better when you have access to large amounts of financial resources. But unfortunately, not everybody has that. And so it's sort of our duty, our responsibility as an industry to bring down that pricing as much as possible to make it affordable to everybody. So those who want to can. So it's no longer a financial issue. It's a moral issue. Great. So uh, in the last few minutes, why don't we run through those other slides for the landscaping, uh, Malu? Um, 
that you sent me about an example of the lower planting, the upper planting, how people, if they're trying to do this by themselves, what can they do to make their landscape more environmentally sustainable? Uh, if you don't mind going to those pictures, like this special. Sure. Yeah, this was a, a conceptual design we did for um, a, a lovely couple in Guadalupe. Um, but again, you, it's just the, the layer of adding native plants as your base. This is what you start with. And then upon that, you, you get the concept. So they, this first concept is this kind of the cascading feeling of, um, of, uh, of plants falling over uh, the side of a planter as you walk up the stairs. I think the next slide shows the, the upper planter and the specific um, plants that we recommended to go along with that. So these are, again, really basic conceptual designs, but getting people to think about their place um, in Hawaii and then uh, what, it, what is appropriate to plant there. And then well, I, I, this... interrupt. I'm interested sure. in rosemary. Is that edible rosemary that you're talking so, about? So they, yeah, they, they did ask for additional plants as well as um, native. So rosemary was an example of this cascading plant that wasn't native, but we try always with our base to start with the natives. And then if, if anything is um, requested further, then as long as it's not invasive, uh, then, it, you know, we, we also provide that as well. Okay, go on. Sorry, Dr. Sure. So the second concept here was this kind of minimalist, um, almost more oriental style of um, um, kind of, yeah, uh, manicured landscaping. That And native plants, again, also do play a role here. Akia is also a really sculptural uh, plant. Uh, Ali'i is awesome and uh, really resilient to these kinds of environments. And then the last one is this idea of kipuka. So we, we do have the potential to provide, uh, you know, um, irrigation. So it's not always dry land forests or, uh, those types of plants. We could, we can do mesic, we could do these kinds of water intensive plants, but, uh, we always try and be really upfront that this is, um, you know, a little bit more temperamental and it's going to cost you a little bit more. Um, but we do provide that option. Yeah, no, I mean, it you guys have inspired me to plant more drought tolerant plants now i was looking online i was asking my alexa i said are pomegranates drought tolerant are <laughs> well, you definitely inspired me so <laughs> thank you so much i mean we're out of time so we have to wrap it up but i'm dr neil this is healthy planet on the think tech live streaming network series we've been talking with malu and christian founders of leahi landscaping Thanks to Michael, our broadcast engineer, and the rest of our crew at ThinkTech for hosting our show. And thanks to you, our listeners, for listening. I'll see you in two weeks for more Healthy Planet on ThinkTech, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet. My guest will be Cindy Teixeira from the Hawaii Animal Kuleana Alliance. If you have ideas for the show or questions for my future show guests, please contact me at healthyplanetthinktech at gmail.com. Check out my website at graceinhawaii.com or Instagram at gracefulliving365. For more information on my projects, including future show guests, I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. Aloha, everyone.